Chapter 4, Informal Greetings Magda unwrapped the sandwich Mom had packed for the bike ride that never happened and took a bite. They're really nice, the Bensons. I flicked my finger at the wax paper, not hungry. I was going to tell Mom that Mrs. Benson fed me a bunch of junk food, but I didn't have the energy to say something mean about her. If Jack hadn't paraded down the stairs, clanking tool belt and all, and I might have even agreed with Magda, about Mrs. Benson, anyway. She had a good imagination. Instead, I pout-slouched, something I'm pretty sure they put you in the penalty box for in etiquette class. Cassidy, what's wrong? Mom asked me. She's mad because Jack took the handyman job at the Bensons instead of going with her to the gravel pit, Magda said, picking olives out of her cream cheese spread and wiping them on her plate. Definitely a penalty box offense. I offered to take her myself, but we have to make it quick. Sabrina's coming over at two. Magda set her sandwich down and got that dreamy chemistry look she's so famous for. Album covers aren't like regular paperboard, you know. They're covered with a veneer. If you try to clean them with soap or even worse, vinyl record cleaner, it removes the ink and makes them bubble. So the challenge is how to keep mold from eating the paper. And if there's a paste glue in the seam, there might be silverfish too. Silverfish loves starch. She stopped talking and sat there with her mouth open, hypnotized. If Sabrina hadn't been trying to hang those old album covers, she would have thought Magda was a total zero. But Magda had better karma than me. Does your karma make you a boy or a girl? I asked Mom. What a strange question, Cassidy. I don't know. I'm not as informed about karma as Janai. I always thought the boy-girl thing was about chromosomes, and karma was more like what goes around comes around. I agree. I couldn't have done anything that bad before I was even born. I'm not following you, honey. If I was a boy, Great Grandma Reed wouldn't have left etiquette lessons, and Mrs. wouldn't have left me etiquette lessons, and Mrs. Benson would have asked me to hang her pictures and wear her husband's tool belt. Pretty sure karma doesn't take. Excuse me. Pretty sure karma takes into account your previous lifetimes, Magda. Mm -mm. Magda said, reaching for an apple from the bowl in the middle of the table. Well, how am I supposed to do anything about those? You call yourself calamity. You love hobos and you dream of outrunning railroad cops. Maybe you have outlaw karma. Magda rubbed the apple on her shirt and took a bite. On another day, it might be exciting to think about the possibility of having outlaw karma, but not today. I'm going back to bed, I announced, leaving the room and making clomping noises on the stairs. The same stair, to be exact. It always worked on Mom and Magda, who thought my clomping on the stairs meant that I was out of range. Mom. Poor Cassidy. Really, she really wanted to go on a bike ride. Magda. You should have seen Jack. He followed Sabrina around like a baby bird. Mom. Do you think he has a crush on her? Magda. Well, it's hard not to. She's so interested in you. Like, learning to fall out of buildings and preserving record albums are the most fascinating things she could think of. Mom. Maybe she's being polite. Magda. Maybe. But she asks good questions, too, and she's coming here in a couple hours to see my lab and then over to Jack's to see the setup in his garage. Mom, I guess it's time. For Jack, I mean. Remember Janai kept him back in the young in young fives. He is a year older. Didn't you notice the other day when he wore shorts how hairy his legs have gotten? Magda, but Sabrina's my age, Mom. Mom, oh, Magda, you don't choose your first crush. My first crush was my sixth grade math teacher. He was a brand spanking new te he was brand spanking new to teaching, and the way he'd run in from the parking lot with his tie plastered to his face, or use his pencil in his fist to make an exclamation point when you got the right answer. Adorable. That was enough listening for me. T M I. Of course Jack didn't have a crush on Sabrina. Jack and I were not at all interested in that. You had to be totally focused when you were flapping into the top of a speeding railway car or balancing on a telephone wire. If Jack let his head fill up with the thoughts of high school girls and polka dot headbands, he'd be a pavement tattoo before he was 13. When I got to my room, I threw open the window and crawled under my bed, so if Mom and Magda came looking, they'd think I'd finally decided to run away. If I really was Calamity Cassidy in a previous lifetime, that would explain my present circumstances. I wasn't the sort of girl to shoot innocent bystanders, but who knows? In a heated gunfight, with outlaws behind every saloon door, maybe a stray bullet of mine had zinged the town librarian. That's when I decided to start improving my karma. With the kind of weird dreams and fears I had, geez, maybe I'd plugged half a dozen charity workers or members of the church choir 
So starting Tuesday morning, I would give out better than I got. When Jack came over to walk with me to school, I wouldn't ream him out for throwing me over. I'd say, how was church? Good eats? So, how was church? Good eats? Mimi brought potato knishes and babka. My cousin Reggie from Toledo showed us these sweet Parker, vi Parker videos excuse me, parkour video clips from the movie District B-13. I want to be David Bell when I grow up. Jack was so excited about the stunts he'd seen on the video clip, he didn't notice how polite I was being. We were almost to school before he said, Hey Cass, how come you're so quiet? You still cheesed off that I worked at the Bensons instead of going to the gravel pit with you? Me? No, I forgot about that. Jack put his hand on my forehead. You're not running a fever, are you? No, but thank you for inquiring. Come on, Cass, tell me what's eating you. You know you can't hold it inside. It'll pop out sometime today. I swallowed. Fine weather we're having. Okay, be that way. Two can play that game. Look, there's Delton. Let's practice being nice to him. Jack! Being nice to Delton Bean was like going to the Karma World Series two days after you got bumped from the, bumped up from the minors. I'd be willing to bet that at 11, Delton Bean had a brain even bigger than Magda's. Ever since... Every chance he got, he had to show it off, too. Good morning, Jack. Good morning, Cassidy. Good morning, Delton. Did you have a nice holiday weekend? Delton looked at me all suspicious, like he didn't know the rules of this extremely boring game we were playing called chit-chat. Yes, I did, he said finally. My dad took me to the Third Coast Transportation Museum in Marshfield. We have a membership. I was interested in their traveling exhibit of World War II fighter planes. The combustion engines of planes manufactured in the United States during that time were the very first made out of silicone. I yawned, but I covered my mouth first, which is the correct order. You don't say. I was beginning to wonder if all this goodness was worth it. I mean, I was already a girl. In class, Mrs. Parsons was handing back our final paper. I know the weather feels like summer vacation, but we still have important work to do here. Your writing portfolios will be forwarded to your middle school language arts teachers. Some of them are ready to go, but some of you... She paused at our table and dropped my portfolio folder in front of me. Seem to have intentionally misunderstood the assignment. As you recall, you were supposed to research a field of interest, some occupation you could see yourself holding in the future. I'd like those of you whose portfolios are finished to work on peer evaluations with those whose papers still need polishing. So, Haley, will you work with Marcy? Jack, you pair up with Graham. And Delton, I think you, leave, you will be very helpful to Calamity here. Calamity? Graham piped up. When I read your rough draft, it was catastrophe. It doesn't take much of our class to go on a laughing jack. Magda warned me not to use my road name, but Mrs. Parsons said she wanted colorful language, and I spent a lot of time picking out that name. Catastrophe Cassidy was my first runner-up. I told myself that the laughing didn't matter. I'd been nice to Delton before school. Now Delton would be nice to me so I could finish my paper, and more importantly, fifth grade. Delton read the title of my paper. Your occupation of interest is hobo? She told us to pick something interesting. I crossed out the word hobo and replaced it with night of the road. If I changed every hobo to night of the road, I might meet the, meet the minimum word count. What did you pick? Aeronautical engineer, of course, like my dad. Delton scanned the first page of my paper before reaching into his backpack for his red pen. Cassidy, we were supposed to cover contemporary issues in the field. Job security, earning potential, regional... I did, look here. Delton made clicking noises with his tongue as he read. So, hobos live off the goodwill of others, they have each other's backs, and your dad says with rising gas prices, more people than ever are riding the Amtrak, making you confident that we'll add more train lines? You used your dad as your main source? Well, it's hard to pin down a real hobo. Possibly because they are extinct? You know very well there are no classified ads for hobos. Delton uncapped his pen and put it in hover mode over my paper. Where to begin? Then he stopped talking to me and started talking to my paper. Setting aside the logical fallacy that hobos exist, I would argue that with this transition between hobo hash and barter arrangements, can you really be a hobo and not know when the steam engine was invented? As his pen scooted over the pages, I concentrated on scraping a blob of 100% fruit preserves off my shirt. 
Maybe you should change your stage name to Rambling Rose, he muttered, handing back my paper. It's my road name, thank you very much. I scanned all the pen marks. That's it? Delton had messed up my paper so bad, I'd have to retype the whole thing. I thought you were supposed to fix it. The purpose of peer evaluation, Cassidy, is to give feedback to the author of the paper, not to fix it. You and I both know you are perfectly capable of doing it yourself, if you choose to. I've seen your standardized test scores. You were almost as high as me in expository writing. I grabbed the sheets of paper and started to fold them. Whenever I didn't like something, I tried to make it disappear. In second grade, I taught myself to fold papers with bad grades into packages so small I could slip them into my shoe. But papers get longer in fifth grade, and no matter how I folded, I couldn't conceal this mess. Thanks for nothing, Delton. You've got a lot of nerve saying those things about my honest efforts. Delton Pitch, excuse me, Bel <laughs> Delton pinched the tip of his nose, which was just one of his many nervous habits. Was I too forthcoming? My mother says I need to work on my social cues. She says being blunt isn't a leading-edge technique in the workplace, and that the reason my father doesn't advance is his lack of understanding in the area of social cues. He moved from the tip of his nose to his earlobe. How should I have handled it, Cassidy? Should I have said it was a good paper, even if it wasn't? I guess not. I managed to make my paper small enough to sit on it with no corners showing. Then you'd just be a phony. Like you were to me this morning when you asked about my weekend? Can't a girl be nice without raising suspicions? Well, no. Not you, anyway. Say, Delton, you're a smart guy. What do you know about karma? Karma? Yeah, you know, the old what-goes-around-comes-around thing. Are you asking me for the definition? Delton slipped his cell phone from his pocket and consulted the Internet. I guess it's just that lately I feel like maybe I have, I don't know, rotten karma. And I'm wondering if I can turn it around before, mm, let's say, just before June 14th. What's special about June 14th? None of your bees beeswax. I don't know, Cassidy. It says here that karma is built up over lifetimes. I'm not sure being nice to me this morning is enough to turn that around. Delton, I hope you, you, you are using your handheld device for academic purposes. Otherwise, I'll have to confiscate it. The sudden appearance of our teacher made Delton switch from pin pinching his earlobe to folding a pleat in his lower lip. We were talking about karma, we were talking about karma, Mrs. Parsons, and I was looking up the definition. What does karma have to do with where is your paper, Cassidy? Um, I shuffled my hands around in my backpack and looked on either side of the table as if I dropped it. She's sitting on it, Mrs. Parsons. Isn't it time to transition to social studies? I can't really count the last 20 minutes as instructional time. In fact, I've noticed that student time on task has taken a huge dive since field games day. As Mrs. Parsons walked away, I whispered, I may have rotten karma, but you have snitch karma, Delton, and that is much worse. All I did was tell the truth. She didn't even ask you. You should have kept quiet. You would make a lousy hobo. There's a big difference between a catastrophe and a calamity. Getting hit by a train is a catastrophe. Going over Niagara Falls in a barrel is a calamity. The way I figure it, you get a fighting chance with calamity. Things don't look too pretty, but people have survived a barrel ride over the falls. Get hit by a train, and you've got a one-way ticket to that great cattle car in the sky. It takes brains, ingenuity, and nerves of steel to survive a calamity. I knew that, according to my own definition, etiquette lessons were only a calamity, something to survive and do my best to forget then why did they feel like such a catastrophe? Was it because every Monday and Wednesday from June 14th through July 14th, a.k.a. the best part of summer vacation, I would be imprisoned in a stuffy classroom? If the other great calamity in history, Calamity Jane, was telling this story, she'd, kip, she'd skip the boring junk about how I revised my paper to focus on being part of the transportation industry and how I finished up my social studies poster about the Incas. For family night, Mrs. Parsons made me cover the part where they sacrificed their babies. I might tell the story of how, in retaliation for being forced to wear a dress and curl my hair for the fifth grade graduation ceremony, I wore my sister's tap shoes to cross the stage and palmed Principal Janesco a note that read, See you later, alligator, when he, took my, when he shook my hand. But no, I think Calamity Jane would skip ahead straight to the moment when, on a beautiful summer morning, only three days out of fifth grade, I stood in front of Miss Star Melton Mowry's School of Poise and Purpose. End of chapter four.